Welcome to Insights at the Edge, produced by Sounds True. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and I'd love to take a moment to introduce you to the Sounds True Foundation. The goal of the Sounds True Foundation is to provide access and eliminate financial barriers to transformational education and resources, such as teachings and trainings on mindfulness, emotional awareness, and self-compassion. If you'd like to learn more and join with us in our efforts, please visit SoundsTrueFoundation.org. In this episode of Insights at the Edge, my guest is Todd Hera. Todd has over a decade of experience as a licensed funeral director and embalmer, and he's a certified post-mortem reconstructionist and cremationist. Todd has written two nonfiction books about the profession, Mortuary, Confidential, and Over Our Dead Bodies. And he's also an associate editor for Southern Calls, a renowned journal in the funeral profession. With Sounds True, Todd has written a new book, and it's called Last Rites, The Evolution of the American Funeral. Quite honestly, I've never spoken before with a funeral director. And quite honestly, I've never even been inside a funeral home. So talking to Todd was a whole lot of new for me, new information, new insights, and new understandings about right now where we are in the evolution of the funeral business and how we can make the experience of dealing with our dead, something that we talk about that's above board, that's not taboo, and that's treated as holy, as sacred, which it is. Here's my conversation with Todd Hera. Todd, I know you're a fourth generation undertaker. Tell me a little bit, and by way of introducing yourself to our listeners, what is the family lineage of being in the funeral business that you come from? Well, first off, Tammy, thank you for having me on your show. And my family lineage in the profession goes back to before the Civil War, uh, with a few stops and starts along the way. A lot of funeral directors have this kind of you know direct family tree, uh, father to son, father to son, as it was for so many years, uh, you know, prior to women becoming, uh, you know, the predominant population in mortuary school classes. Uh, But my uh, great, great, great grandfather was James White. He was a cabinet maker in Milford, Delaware. And as such, uh, the townspeople would call on him when there was a death in, uh, in the family, and they would bring him a piece of knotted string for the measurements of the decedent who would have been laid out, washed and anointed at home. And James would construct a custom built coffin in his shop. And just by the nature of his vocation, uh, he became the town's undertaker. And this was quite common. Uh, These folks, uh, carpenters, joiners, upholders, chandlers, uh, just by nature of what they did for a living, were often the town's undertakers. James's son, Isaac. he fought in the Civil War, and right around that time, embalming came to be a common practice. And uh, Isaac picked up um, the skill of embalming and became a very successful undertaker, taking the mantle from his father and running with it. And when he died in, uh, I want to say it was 1917, um, his, his obituary has a line in it that uh, sticks with me, and it says, he lived and died without a known enemy. Now, there was a break after this of uh, several generations. Isaac and his wife, Rachel, had one daughter, and uh, Isaac told his daughter, uh, who would be my great-grandmother, you know, this, this business is no place for a woman, which is just absolutely laughable this day and age with um, every single graduating mortuary class is well over 50 
percent, closer to 75 percent uh, hmm. female. So, you know, females are, uh, you know, the future of our profession. Uh, but anyway, Isaac told his daughter, you know, you can't go into the profession. And the uh, family business changed hands several times. Um, it's still in existence in Milford as a different name, uh, but our original family business still exists. Now, my uncle, um, he got into uh, the profession in the mid 70s, and he now owns the, uh, the firm that, that I work for. Now, specifically, Todd, why were you drawn? Like, I want to keep this tradition alive. I want to work with my uncle. I mean, you could have done other things, of course. Why did you choose this? Honestly, I think the profession chose me. I had no intention, no designs of going into this. Uh, you know, I see with with a lot of, um, you know, people in the profession, you know, they're almost pressured by their family to kind of continue this mantle in the town, uh, continue the family legacy. You know, there's no such pressure. My parents are not associated with uh, funeral directing, the funeral profession at all. And uh, honestly, you know, I thought I wanted to go into some type of medicine. And the summer after college, uh, I needed a job and just asked my uncle, hey, you know, can I work part time at the funeral home, you know, doing some odd jobs. So I started doing what a, a lot of people do, you know, washing the cars, you know, just holding the door at services, kind of, you know, very unskilled labor, but still needs to be done, running the vacuum cleaner, stuff like that. And really, you know, I think the work found me. Okay, but tell me more about that. Like, I get how you started doing it, but what was that spark that went off in you that said, uh, "I think this is actually my path"? It's it's such a helping profession. Uh, it, just watching uh, the the men and women in in our profession that stand there, and, and really, we stand with families and bear witness to their grief, and that's that's the main thing that we're doing. We're walking with them in their grief journey and families will come in uh, after the first call is made and they'll come in to make the funeral arrangements and there's so much uncertainty and anxiety i wouldn't say fear is a good word but fear of the unknown and we sit down and we talk about you know what we need to do to get them and their you know loved one their dead loved one to where they need to be. And when they leave that funeral arrangement, usually the relief is palpable. And I formed some friendships with, with people just, you know, they come in and, you know, it's a new case or an intake that's assigned to me. I don't know these people from, from Adam. And, you know, by the end of the process, um, you know, whether their loved one is, is buried or burned, um, and by burned, I mean cremated, um, you know, we become friends, we've connected. Uh, it's a very intimate experience. And, you know, standing there, you know, as, as a young man just out of college washing cars. And, you know, I think what initially maybe drew me towards the idea of medicine was that it's a helping profession. And that's what I liked about it. Not necessarily the medicine, but the, the idea of helping people. And this is what we do in the funeral profession. We, we, we're helping people, um, you know, start that grief journey. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mentioned to you, Todd, when we were just introducing ourselves before we started recording that I've never spoken to a, a funeral director before. And I noticed that the stereotype that's now part of the culture of somebody being like, you know, marking up the casket and trying to talk you into a higher price or something like that, that I had bought into that myself a bit. And talking to you, I can see the holy work, the therapeutic work, the healing work of someone in your role. And it seems like it's one of those professions that needs to be, if you will, almost rebranded in the culture or understood better, at least. I'm wondering what you think about that. That's people like myself, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, there's a number of podcasts by funeral service professionals uh, young men and women, uh, they're, we're out there trying to evangelize what we're doing uh, because funeral service is not necessarily, you know, what 
you or I and our parents and our grandparents think of as kind of the traditional funeral service where you must do that or you must do this. And, you know, back in 1963, when Jessica Mitford published her scathing expose of our profession, you know, kind of painting us with this broad brush of that, you know, we're all these, you know, money grubbing, uh, you know, shyster undertakers. Um, and, and that's that's unfair in the way that, you know, I think every profession has bad actors in it. Sure. And do funeral, are, are there bad actors in, in the funeral profession? Absolutely. Just the same as there are bad police officers and bad doctors and bad lawyers. But to paint us all with that same brush is, is, is really unfair. And, you know, the funeral profession um, was, I don't want to say largely silent, but their, their response to what she published wasn't effective enough. They should have started doing this rebranding. 50 years ago, uh, because most of us get into this profession to, you know, help people. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you it's not a business because it absolutely also is a business, just like a doctor's office has a practice. You know, he's sure. got to make money to stay in business. So, you know, people say, well, you mark up the casket. Of, of course we do. But we try to do it in a reasonably fair way so we can make money and stay in business and continue to serve our community. But we're also the ones that are, you know, putting our employees in your local Rotary clubs and your local Kiwanis clubs and sponsoring your Little League teams and sponsoring your church dinners so that money just isn't going into this, you know, stockholders pocket, if you will. Um, you, you know, your your typical local funeral home is very invested in the community, and they're going to put that money back into the community in positive ways. Mm -hmm. Now, Todd, I want to talk to you about the theme of your new book, Last Rites, and we'll be talking about the evolution of the American funeral. And I also want to talk to you about funeral rites in general, historically and into the future. But before we get there, I want to know how being in this profession has changed you. As in, let's start with spending so much time because you're also certified and have been trained as an embalmer and a post-mortem reconstructionist. You spend a lot of time, at least this is my assumption, with dead bodies probably more than most of us. I think I, I mean, I can't, I, you know, I've spent a few hours, I've been at two deaths and have had the privilege and honor of being at those deaths and being with a corpse, but not for very much time. And I was reflecting, what would it be like to have spent a lot of time with corpses and how would that impact my psyche and my view of life? So what's your response to that? There's, there's something very sacred of a family entrusting you, turning over really, you know, their most precious possession into your, your hands. You know, you think about it, you know, you sh we, the undertaker, shows up at somebody's house a lot of times in the middle of the night. And, you know, we're, we're carting off your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, you know, whomever it may be, somebody, you know, you have 60, 80 years of history with, and that person means so much to you. Uh, so there's, there's definitely, you know, a sacredness and a responsibility to handling uh, our community's dead. One that, you know, I, I am just so honored that the community entrusts us, me with, um, you know, but then there's also that other piece of it where, um, you know, at this, I go home at the end of the day. Um, sometimes it's late, you know, our hours can be very varied, but, you know, I've, I've got a family and, um, at the same time, I also have to practice, you know, a little bit of emotional distance. Uh, people die in, in all sorts of different, uh, ways, sometimes extremely tragic ways. And, um, you, you know, sometimes I, I almost have to 
you, you know, flip an emotional switch or else, you, you know, I could be down in those grief trenches with that family. And if that was the case, I wouldn't be able to help them. Uh, and maybe to give an example, like, uh, you know, when a child dies, that's very emotionally hard on me because I have children and, you know, just seeing that I, I almost project like, oh my gosh, this, this could be my child. This could be my situation. Um, so, you know, while I reverently care for that dead child, I also have to, you know, practice a, a sense of emotional distance for my own self preservation, uh, a little bit of professionalism. Um, but certainly that doesn't diminish, uh, you know, the amount of care uh, I give to that family. Mm -hmm. I mentioned that I've uh, been with corpses just twice in my life. And I know in other cultures where there's an opportunity to be with corpses for longer periods of time after a death, you can sit with the corpse for days sometimes, or in other countries at other times, you would encounter a corpse. And that there's a way in our culture, death has been uh, you know, uh, turned, it's been so medicalized that many people don't even have that experience. And, and I'm wondering what you think about that. In, in our culture early on in the colonial period, um, it was very common for the families to have a very close and frequent relationship with death, meaning the families would wash and anoint their dead and sit with them and literally wake them you know, make sure it wasn't a false death and sit with them until signs of decomposition started and they knew it was safe to bury their dead. Now, at the turn of the 20th century, uh, you're absolutely right. Americans started turning over the care of their sick and their dead to institutions, i.e. hospitals and the newly formed funeral parlors. And Throughout the, the 20th century, you know, you see uh, Americans starting to, I don't want to say distance themselves, but, you know, they certainly turned over the care to professionals. And, you know, that's why we see almost this fear or perverseness, people saying, oh, you know, I, I can't go into that viewing. I don't, I, you know, I can't see a dead body. It's because we've become out of touch with, uh, you know, the sights, the sounds, the smells of our dead, uh, which are still very prevalent in other cultures. But I'm seeing that start to turn around. In, in researching this book, um, you know, home funerals are becoming more and more frequent now where family members will uh, do the, the washing, the dressing themselves. And sometimes they will work in conjunction with the funeral home to help them with, uh, you know, some of maybe, maybe the, the paperwork that needs to be done or some of the other logistical things as simple as, uh, you know, hey, bring your hearse over. We're going to transport so-and-so from the house to, you know, the cemetery or the crematorium at this time. So, you know, maybe that family doesn't have a vehicle large enough. So we are seeing, um, you know, almost this this throwback to an earlier time, uh, this movement starting in America. Mm -hmm. And from your perspective, what is underneath the rise of this interest in people changing the profession from what it's come to today to what people are wanting it to be now and moving forward? What's underneath that? I honestly think people want to get back in touch. Um, you know, it, it, there's certain situations where ceremonies can be very sterile and people, especially with the internet and having more information available, they're realizing, hey, you know, I, I feel like this is something I want to do. And so they look on the internet and all of a sudden they're like, this is something I can do. Whereas maybe before they had that feeling 20, 30 years ago and without the internet, they had no means of making that, that feeling, that vision they had a reality because they just didn't have the information to uh, properly execute it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Todd, let's say I come to you and I say, uh, my family is asking me to get clear on how I want my corpse to be handled at the time of my death. 
-hmm. And I'd like to know what all of my options are. Sure. Sure. I want to know what all my options are. I don't want to look, you know, I don't want to look on the internet. I want you, the professional expert to tell me what are all my options? As far as final disposition or what you can do? What will come of my corpse and how I want my family to handle it? Well, this is a national podcast. So any any of your listeners that have these questions, uh, 50 states, there's 50 different set of rules. So, you know, speaking in very general terms, I would say if, if you or one of your listeners had that question, then uh, either go to your local funeral home and see if you can find a funeral director that will be able to uh, walk you through, you know, state specifically what exactly you can do, or there are uh, guides that kind of go through state by state what is permissible for a home funeral. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, in your new book, Last Rites, we uh, go back into history. And then we also talk about this time that we're in and some of these new trends moving forward. But let's go back into history a bit. And even uh, before embalming, what were some of the ways that across the whole world, people started treating their dead that was different than just throw the body into the ground? Well, Honestly, I, I did focus on, on the American funeral rite, l- touching on its origins in, you know, where they came from in, in Western civilization, Rome and Egypt. So it wasn't really a cross-cultural kind of global look. Uh, I didn't research, um, you know, any other cultures that didn't, I would say, largely contribute to the American funeral rite. So I, I don't know if I can answer that specifically, but you know, interestingly, um, you know, cremation was the favored form of disposition until uh, Constantine took over. And, and really, after that, you see this kind of large rise in, in inhumation. And the thing that interested me was, you know, I always was under the impression that had specifically to do with, with Christianity and Christian uh, the, kind of the Christian dogma of burying the dead. But I read something um, that it may have had to do with, with uh, a military, a strategic move in that uh, these cremations would take, you know, they'd have to fell these huge timbers and build these huge pyres to uh, completely um, combust somebody. And they were threatening the wood resources needed. So the theory is it was partially uh, this Christ- Christian dogma and partially due to a military strategic move uh, in, in conserving wood resources that, you know, Constantine then decreed that uh, everyone had to be buried. Okay. And uh, in terms of your book, Last Rites, tracing the, the roots of our current Western funeral, what are those roots? I would say that the, the the main roots, you know, everyone goes back to Egypt where um, mummification uh, started, which mummification and embalming are uh, similar. They're not the same. Uh, the goals are different. With mummification, the goal was preservation forever of, of, of the remains. Whereas embalming, uh, the the primary goal is disinfection and then temporary preservation enough time so you can conduct the the funeral rites. Uh, embalming uh, is is not meant for you know eternal preservation, but the roots of modern embalming certainly are in mummification because the anatomists in Western Europe at the time were studying. Um, you know, texts of, of people that had traveled to Egypt to observe uh, these, these, uh, this cadre of people that were performing the mummifications, uh, folks like Herodotus. Um, so I would say, you know, one of the big piece, pieces of the, uh, the American funeral rite is embalming and how it, you know, came to be and part of the standard, uh, I'm going to say, quote unquote, standard funeral rite in America. And the other thing is um, coffined burial. 
in England at the time that the Puritans came over, uh, they would call it chested burial. Uh, this was not standard in, in Great Britain. Chested burial was reserved for the royalty and the landed gentry. Everyone else was um, shrouded, placed in a parish coffin. So the parish had one coffin and they would transport the remains from the home to the graveyard and bury the shrouded form. Now, again, this was a resource issue in that you have a mature population on a finite land mass and wood is being used for building and also fuel and a number of other things. They couldn't, quote unquote, waste it on burying the dead. The Puritans come over to America and they find this seemingly limitless supply of uh, wood here in America. So from the earliest days in America, uh, in coffin burial was the norm, even for enslaved people. And uh, that's something that has, has carried forward. So I would say kind of the two big pieces that defined the American death ritual early on would be in coffin burial and um, embalming. Mm -hmm. Now, just to uh, differentiate uh, for your listeners, coffins and caskets are uh, different vessels. Uh, coffins are no longer uh, manufactured on a large scale in America. Uh, you, sometimes you can get these uh, artisanal craftsmen that are still making coffins, but the difference is the number of sides. I tell people to think kind of like a Dracula, what Dracula went in. So a coffin has six sides and uh, plus a top and a bottom, and a casket has four. And we see this shift from coffins to caskets um, in the late 19th century in conjunction with the Victorian funeral when there was this softening of death. And Victorians viewed death as, quote unquote, people had gone to their sleep. And so they moved from this kind of grim sounding and anthropomorphic shaped coffin to a softer, nicer sounding vessel called the casket. Mm -hmm. About how many people, what percentage of people in America choose embalming for their dead? To, to break that down, I'm also going to quickly break down uh, the cremation statistics because that's sure. very important for this. Uh, right now in America, we're at about 60% nationally, the cremation rate. So six out of 10 Americans are choosing to be uh, cremated rather than buried. Now, of that 60%, I've seen different figures Um you know, also speaking from experience, the one that kind of I think rings true is 25 to 30 percent of Americans that are choosing to be cremated are also choosing to have kind of the more traditional funeral prior to the cremation. So cremation, burial, alkaline hydrolysis, these are all simply modes of disposition, final disposition, what's happening to the body at the end of the funeral services. So a lot of people that come in and speak with me during the funeral arrangement conference are surprised to say, oh, you mean we can embalm my mom or my dad and lay them out in a cremation casket that's constructed all of wood and have a regular nighttime viewing and take them into church and then go cremate them? I said, yes, of course we can. Um, so, you know, if you add those, those two numbers together, you know, somewhere around 60% of Americans are, are choosing embalming these days. Mm -hmm. Now, if my concern is ecological in terms of my final disposition, I want to do what's best for the earth, what would I choose? There are a lot of, you know, arguments about this, pros and cons. Uh, you know, you hear the people that say, you know, I X number of swimming pools of embalming fluid are buried in the earth, uh, you know, every year. And, you know, once the embalming fluid reacts with the protein, it's no longer formaldehyde. Okay. It's, it's, it becomes inert, you know, it's, it's, it has changed. The protein has changed. Uh, so, so that is not technically true. Um, 
you know, and, and as you break down, your remains break down, you know, you're giving off toxic chemicals. Um, anyway, I mean, of course they're natural, but, you know, you're giving off, uh, you know, acids and, and kind of these other, uh, nasty chemicals that the earth can break down. But, you know, the, the most ecological friendly method would probably be, um, you know, some sort of shrouded burial, um, you know, in a green cemetery would probably create the smallest carbon footprint. Can you explain to me a green cemetery? What's that? And a shrouded burial just means that I'm like wrapped in a, a cloth of some kind. Yep. Yep. Wrapped in a, in a cloth in the old times, it was called a winding sheet or a sear cloth. Um, you know, kind of a useless, but fun little piece of trivia is a lot of times these winding sheets were giving as wedding gifts because they were, you know, cloth was so expensive. Can you imagine getting a winding sheet as a wedding gift? Um, but anyhow, I digress. Green, green cemeteries, there are three different kinds. Uh, the first kind is the hybrid kind. And that kind is, I would say, the most prevalent today. That's a regular, I'm going to say regular cemetery. Okay, so a corporate cemetery with, with upright monuments and, and you know burial vaults. They open up a section that takes green burials. And this is a way a lot of kind of these older ailing cemeteries are revitalizing themselves is by opening up a green burial section uh, in their in their cemetery. Mm -hmm. And then tell me what a green burial, what, what happens during a green burial? I tell people there are different shades of green. So green burial means a different thing to each family you serve. Okay. So for some people, a green burial uh, means you, you know, wrap the remains in a sheet and take them to a conservation um, green cemetery, which is kind of the most rigorous of the, uh, the green cemeteries on, on, in terms of, you know, what's allowed, what's not least amount of carbon footprint. And for other people, you know, they're saying, well, a green burial to me is to, uh, you know, embalm, you know, my loved one with an ecologically friendly embalming fluid, have them laid out for a viewing, put them in a wicker or a bamboo casket, you know, something that's, uh, you know, readily um, e ecologically friendly to grow and renew and bury them maybe in a hybrid section of an existing cemetery. So there are definitely different shades of green. There's no one definition of green burial. And it's, I, I tell people it's whatever you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. Okay, Todd, here you are. You're an insider. Doesn't get to be any more of an insider when it comes to all things burial, funereal, cremation related. What's your stated wishes for yourself? Frankly, I'd like to be buried in the traditional manner. And, and again, when I say traditional, I mean uh, the tradition that was, you know, our parents and our grandparents. Um, I'd like the nighttime viewing. I see value in uh, viewing the dead and affirming that they're dead um, and, and letting the family members process that by sight. Um, and, you know, I'd like to be buried in a casket in a cemetery. Mm-hmm very uh, clearly stated. Yes. Yeah. And the other reason for that is permanent memorialization. And maybe that's a little bit of, you know, my own sentiment creeping in because, you know, once my kids and grandkids die, you know, that's just a name on a headstone. But, you know, looking back, you know, research for this book and talking to genealogists and stuff, you know, if there's no permanent memorialization, you know, what happens to that name? What happens to the record of that person's life? Sure, it's just a headstone sitting there. But if you go on findagrave.com, you know, you can find all these different people from hundreds of years ago. And a lot of times there's a little bio there. Um, and, and again, you know, I'm not uh, kind of denigrating anyone's choice, but that's, that's, you know, 
my choice. This, you right. know, I see value in having that permanent memorialization. I think partly because of the research I had to do for this book. You know, find all these people that had been dead hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. What of the research that you did for Last Rites surprised you the most? I think the cost in funerals. Uh, the cost, if you look at the cost of your funeral today, people say, oh my gosh, the, you know, they're so expensive. And I'm not going to lie to you and say they're not. They are. It is a big purchase that uh, families should be planning ahead for. Absolutely. But overall, compared how much to, money do I need to set aside? It, it depends on what you I want know, to do. I know, but approximately. I would say ten to $15,000. Okay. Okay. And, and again, of course, you know, it's probably going to be cheaper to have a funeral in Manhattan than it is down somewhere in Mississippi. So you also have to look at geographically where you're located when you're, you're financially planning for your funeral. Um, but that being said, compared to the total of somebody's net worth, funerals have gone down in cost. In colonial times, it was not unusual for a funeral to suck up an entire fifth of somebody's estate because of Whoa. the costly morning gifts and the repast they were expected to give everyone that came to the funeral. You know, roads were bad, travel was more difficult back then. So when people made the effort to come to a funeral, they expected not only the finest fare to be laid out for them. So people were slaughtering, you know, their hogs, their chickens, you know, you know, Basically, you know, these these fine foods that were reserved for special occasions, but also it was one of the few occasions when drinking was condoned and people were expected to get lubricated at a funeral. And there's there's this colonial colloquialism, and that's kind of fun to say, but it went when a child was born, the parents would start saving wine for their wedding or funeral. Is very much true. Uh, I read a lot of accounts where, uh, and some of them made it into the book, where you know the families would crack open these great kegs of wine. A couple of instances, they would crack open what was called a pipe of wine, and a pipe held 126 gallons. So the mourners would come and drink 120. That's a lot of wine. Um, and you, you know, think about the immense cost of this, and then couple that with the funeral gifts, the morning gifts that the families were expected to provide. And these weren't just simple prayer cards or memorial folders or a packet of seeds like the family will give out at a modern funeral. We're talking about gold rings, gloves, scarves, books. So again, luxury uh, items back in colonial America that would cost the family an immense amount of money. Um, the the coffin may may have cost you know three to five percent of the total funeral bill. The entire cost was in the uh, post funeral meal, the repast, or the funeral gifts. And was the notion that this was a way of honoring the deceased? This was a way of celebrating the glory of their life by having such a resource intensive celebration. It, it was. And the, the funeral gifts were, were very practical in they were supposed to be a remembrance of the dead. So you wear that ring every time you look at that ring, you remember so and so. Uh, the scarves, for, especially for the men, were expected to be sewn into uh, their jackets as a lining. So every time you put your jacket on, you see that scarf and you remember so and so. Uh, again, gloves uh, were, were a luxury. Uh, item back then. And, you know, so you get a nice pair of gloves. Every time you put those gloves on, you remember so-and-so. So it was very much, uh, you know, this, this culture of, um, you know, remembering the dead and honoring and venerating uh, their dead. Mm -hmm. What do you think is the core today, Todd, when it comes to making a ceremony sacred? truly filled with honoring and not just like something people are crossing off a list or something like that. What's the, what's the key to that? So Tammy, that's, that's a great question because I would say over 50% of the families that come down and sit across from the desk from me are unchurched. So in the past, it was very easy 
for funeral directors, you know, you have a Catholic sit down, they're going to have a Catholic mass. You have a Lutheran sit down, they're going to their Lutheran church. They're going to use, you know, kind of those religious, tried and true religious rubrics. Whereas now the, the unchurched, it's a bit trickier in that we're starting from scratch every time. Mm -hmm. And I think to answer your question, the key is to find meaning for that family. And the meaning may be different, and it is different for every family. Some families will, you know, highly value this aspect, you know, songs, and other families will, you know, highly value, you know, a slideshow during the show. And, you know, I've had families that, you know, the, the grandchildren have done an interpretive dance. And that's been, you know, so the, the meaning, I think, comes from, you know, what that person, the decedent, meant to you and how you're going to express it to your family members and the community. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this notion of, you know, uh, we're not going to have a funeral, we're going to have a celebration of life and the renaming in that way? To quote author Thomas Lynch, who uh, is a fantastic author and also a Michigan funeral director, he cautions us about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. OK, um, it, you know, and, and again, you go to a barber and ask him if you need a haircut. What's the answer you're going to get? You know, if you're asking me, a funeral director, does somebody need a funeral? Of course, I'm going to say yes. This, this is what I subscribe to. This is what I see value in. And I am not against a celebration of life, but I think it needs to be remembered that, you know, this, this is a time of mourning and, you know, there's a reason the funeral ritual is in place because it has served us for so long and it helps us start that grief journey. And if we gloss over it, if we gloss over it with a party where we're just laughing and, you know, drinking and, and doing whatever, I'm afraid that maybe we'll become a, a society of perpetual mourners because we haven't grieved properly for the loss of that person. But don't get me wrong, I, I am not against going out and having a celebration of life uh, as long as it... Um, allows folks to express their grief in a proper form so they can, you know, get all that out, mourn publicly, um, and start to take the first steps on their grief journey. Mm -hmm. Now, you definitely mentioned that meaning is personal. It's personal to the people that are involved, especially when people identify as spiritual but not religious, they have to do their own inner journey of finding what's meaningful for, for, for me, for our family. But what in your experience have you found supports mourning, supports it, allows it, facilitates it? Showing up. It's as simple as that. Just show up. Community support is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, this day and age, we're all too quick to send a text. Hey, I'm sorry, you know, your dad died. I, I, I'm sorry, maybe I'm a little old fashioned, but that doesn't cut it. That doesn't take the place of you taking the time out of your work schedule to just show up for 15 minutes, stand in the receiving line, sign the guest book and face to face say, hey buddy, really sorry you know, your mom, your dad died. Um, people remember if you show up, they remember that. And it means something to them. Just texting them say, hey, if you need something, call me. Those, those are, you know, I'm sorry, but a lot of times they're kind of hollow promises and the family never takes people up on that. But if you take time out of your day uh, to go to a funeral memorial service, wake, visitation, whatever it may be, I can promise you that means something to that family. And that is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. Now we talked some about uh, green burial and in terms of 
the place we are right now and how our funeral practices are evolving. Tell me some about something you write about in the book, mushroom suits. <laughs> what, what are mushroom suits? So the, the the mushroom suit is is very controversial in that there's you know naysayers saying that it's it's junk science and I'm not taking a position that it's junk science or it's not um, having a science background certainly the the theory behind it sounds sound to me in that you take a uh, a shroud or a, a linen suit, and it's impregnated with uh, mushroom spores. And the thought being that when you bury the decedent in this shroud, the mushrooms will then assist in breaking down those toxic chemicals and returning your body to the earth quicker. And this this all gained a lot of fanfare when the actor Luke Perry from 90210 died and uh, chose to be buried in one of these these mushroom suits. And you know, I put it in just as a way so people could see that uh, there are choices. You're not limited to just burial or cremation. Okay, as has been kind of the two, it's it's been very binary for the past 50 years. And before that, it wasn't even binary, it was singular. You had a choice of burial or burial. Um, but you know, there's there's starting to be different choices in in what uh happens to your body after you die. And mm -hmm. this is one of them. Okay. And then also, how is composting different? than what you've described to us as a green burial? So natural organic reduction is what human composting is called. And it was legalized um, when I was writing this book. It was legalized in May of 2020 in Washington state. And it's, it's very new. And the, the idea behind uh, natural organic reduction is that you put the remains, the human remains, in a vessel, okay, a sealed chamber with wood chips or alfalfa or some other type of organic material. And the different providers have kind of a different starter mixture, it seems. Each one has a little bit different kind of quote unquote recipe they're using. And then what they do is they uh, inject oxygen and rotate this vessel for a period. It's usually about 30 days. Uh, some, and again, it, it depends on the provider, some a little bit longer than 30 days, and they have to keep maintain the heat at a certain temperature. And then at the end of the 30 days, uh, the bones are uh, removed from the vessel, uh, much like flame cremation. Uh, a lot of people, I don't think, realize when the uh, cremation's finished, uh, the bones are taken out and then uh, pulverized into this uniform kind of fluffy ash mixture that everyone's aware of. Well, same thing in NOR. And then they're returned to the compost. So what the family actually gets um, is about a cubic yard of uh sterile soil, not sterile in the sense that you can't grow anything in the sense that there's nothing harmful. There's no harmful uh, chemicals in the soil. And the family can take all of that soil back to their land and plant a tree or do whatever they want with it. Or some families will opt to take a token amount because cubic yards of good amount of soil, take a token amount. And then uh, these NOR providers, uh, a lot of them have some sort of agreement with, uh, you know, a, an area of a forest or something where then they will go spread the remainder of that soil. Uh, so with NOR, uh, you're not burying somebody like you would in a mushroom suit in a grave plot. Okay. Similar, you know, that's very green burial. Um, this is, you are getting something that you can then have the flexibility to memorialize almost like cremation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Todd, here we go. Here's the question I'd like to know inside of me. It's a little odd, but what I'm curious about is here you've been around so many bodies after someone has died. Have you had the sense that the animating soul 
if you will, was present and distinct from the physical body? And have you had experiences where it's like, whoa, oh my goodness. Do, have you had any personal experiences like that where you encountered what, I don't know how else to call it, but the soul of the person that was not any longer in their body? It's a corpse and a soul. And you could say, oh, look, oh, wow, that's a presence of some kind. And I can feel or sense or hear it or something like that. I grew up in a house that definitely had a spirit presence. So I am a believer in something exists. What, what do you mean? What happened in the house you were growing up? We would hear footsteps okay. on the second floor when nobody was up there. Um, a lot of times we'd come down in the morning, all the lights in the house would be on or, um, you know, middle of the night, the stereo would come on or the shutters would you know, inexplicably open and shut. And, you know, I think you can explain away a lot of these, especially for the non-believers of, oh, this, you know, you had faulty wiring or this or that, but you add it up and it's, you know, you come to the logical conclusion that it's probably something else, something more. And, you know, I am open to anything uh, as well as certainly believing that there's something out there uh, an energy, uh, where does our soul go? That, that electricity that fires our brain, you know, what happens to that energy when we die and it can't just disappear. So it's got to go somewhere. And people say, oh my gosh, is the funeral home haunted? Are you scared when you're in there alone? You know, personally, my belief is, you know, the people that come back and are with us, um, choose a place maybe even a person that's meaningful to them. So the funeral home's not going to have any meaning to anyone except probably my uncle is going to haunt the you know what out of the funeral home once he goes but you know everyone else we're bringing back they have no connection to our funeral home their soul or their presence is more likely to inhabit their house the baseball diamond, it, it, you know, I, I, I don't know, their, their car, their boat, uh, somewhere that, that uh, is meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that explains it in terms of like uh, what's happening when you go to the funeral home and no, you're not afraid that you're going to encounter various uh, spirits because you have, you, you had that experience in your home. But what I'm talking about is like, while you're embalming, as a professional or something like that. Have you had any like, well, I got a story for you, Tammy. Here's what happened, something like that. All these stories of, uh, you know, bodies sitting up and moving. Yeah, you things know, like that. They're, they're just that, they're stories. And the, the people that tell them, you know, I, I, I always, you know, just kind of chuckle. Yeah, I've been doing this 18 years and I've never seen anything like that happen. And, you know, we do a pretty... Uh, it, we handle a lot of death calls a year. So I would think if if that were happening, I would have seen it. And, and hey, I might be proven wrong. Maybe I'll go into work tomorrow and see something that just blows my mind. But I've never uh, felt a presence of somebody that I've gone to the house or the hospital or a nursing home or wherever. You know, by the time we get there, that person has passed and I think their soul or whatever it is, has moved on to wherever it goes. I have never, you know, felt that sensation um, in the 18 years I've been doing this. Okay, Todd, I can't help myself. I'm going to continue on my uh, uh, slightly odd questioning vein. You mentioned how important uh, it was for you personally to have some kind of gravestone marker, a place where people could memorialize you. Is there room on planet Earth for all of us to have gravestone markers? I mean, is that is that practical? If 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 everyone on Earth was would die tomorrow, we all could be buried in a cemetery the size of uh, I think it's Rhode Island. Okay, you figure you can fit a, a thousand burials into an acre of land. Uh, these people that say we're running out of land, it's, it's again, 
that's just not true. Now, granted, you know, we're taking up a lot of land with houses and office buildings and roads and this, that, and the other thing. Uh, so land is becoming more precious, but there's plenty of space uh, to continue doing burials. And a lot of these older cemeteries um, can be revitalized. And, um, you know, there's plenty of burial spaces in some of these, these old uh, cemeteries. Mm -hmm. Okay, Todd, as we come to a conclusion here, what do you want readers to take away from Last Rites, the evolution of the American funeral? What do you hope is their takeaway after reading the book? When people ask me who I wrote this book for, I tell my mom. And by that, I mean the lay person. This book is not written for funeral professionals. It was written, my idea was so... I could unpack the ideas behind these kind of mysterious, mysterious rites and rituals and make funerals a less intimidating experience. Because I think for a lot of people, and, and I'm like this, if you understand something, it's not scary. It's not intimidating. So in reading this, you'll say, oh, yeah, well, this makes sense. And this makes sense. And suddenly, hopefully, funerals will be less scary and um again, evangelizing what we do, funeral professionals, maybe we can change the narrative. And, um, you know, funeral professionals can be uh, a bit less seen as lurch-like almost, or, you know, as um, kind of these, this stereotype that we've been, we've been branded as for so long. Mm -hmm. And then finally, let's just say someone's listening to this and they're like, you know, I think I could go into this profession and it would be a way for me to be a healing force, a loving force in my community. What would be your advice to them such that they are a healing force, they are a loving force? What would you say, like, keep this in mind? First of all, if this is you, the listener, if you're thinking about doing this, I would say 100% do it. Uh, this is such a rewarding and fulfilling career helping people through some of the darkest times in their lives and making a, a real difference in somebody's life. And if you have any interest in this, the first step would be maybe do some online research, but call your local funeral home and see if you can come in and meet with the funeral director and, and just ask them, say, hey, can I follow you around for a couple of days and see what you do? And a lot of funeral directors would be thrilled to share what they're doing with you and show you how great funeral service is. And from there, then make the decision, hey, should I go to mortuary school or not? But try it a little bit and see see what happens. Um, and if you're like me, maybe the profession will choose you. I've been speaking with Todd Hera. He is the author of a new book with Sounds True, Last Rites, The Evolution of the American Funeral. Todd, thank you for your sincerity and that super good noggin of yours that has done so much terrific research to put our current situation with the American funeral in a historical context. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Again, thank you for having me on, Tammy. Thanks for listening to Insights at the Edge. You can read a full transcript of today's interview at resources.soundstrue.com backslash podcast. That's resources.soundstrue.com slash podcast. If you're interested, hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. And if you feel inspired, head to iTunes and leave Insights at the Edge a review. I absolutely love getting your feedback and being connected. Sounds true. Waking up the world.